Now, there's not a single word stem cell in the title. And, you know, you could, well, there's genes, but that's not stem cells. So you could say, well, why is a stem cell guy going to be giving this talk? Well, I guess also, you know, if you're, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a stem cell biologist, everything somehow comes down to stem cells. Um, but I, I'm also going to make the argument that it was through the stem cell field and a lot of the insights that we began to confront this issue that is the title of tonight and is the title here is, when do we start changing things? So I know it's a very broad audience. What I'm going to do first is just do a, a very quick five-minute overview just to get everybody on the same page in terms of what the stem cell field is and isn't. And then I'll start setting the stage for what I hope will be a very interactive time of talking about. And I, I should say I'm going to be posing more questions than providing answers. Um, what I'll do is I'll lead you through what I think the questions are that are, are facing our field. So I guess you can also see that FAAP means I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So I'm a pediatrician, which means I'm very used to giving, to discussing very complex things to tiny little minds. So, <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> so this is the way you should think about what stem cells are. Um, think of stem cells as the vanilla of your body or the vanilla of whatever happens to be your favorite organ. And the, the area that this was first found was in the nervous system, the brain, which was thought to be the most rigid organ of all. And this notion that there were stem cells made us change from this, notion, uh, from this concept of a very rigid deterministic view of development and of maturation and growth to one of a lot more plasticity. And plasticity not just in utero, but all throughout life, even into, uh, even into old age. So in other words, it changed our entire view of the body and of development, and of even of humankind. Everything from what can happen at a cellular level to the fact that it's not considered silly now for Alzheimer's patients to learn how to do dancing or to enrich the environment of Parkinson's patients. That all was a beneficiary of our new way of thinking in the stem cell field. Now, this was f the stem cells, even though it, it gets a reputation uh, uh, as being this tool for repair, it really is a fundamental part of development of how the system is put together with some inborn bits of plasticity in it. When you talk about repair, what you're thinking of doing is just kind of reinvoking those developmental programs. So it's a different way of looking at medicine. Medicine usually is to try to stop something or you know, stop a process, an antibiotic or some kind of drug. Um, this was different. This gave rise to regenerative medicine because it was kind of think about rebooting your computer or reseeding your lawn, which meant that you still needed to be a developmental biologist. What you really are doing is being a translational developmental biologist. And for the brain, for example, we know that there are many ways to get to the building block of the brain. And I'm just going to use the brain as an example, but this can apply to any organ that's your favorite organ. As Woody Allen once said, the brain was his second favorite organ. <laughs> The neural stem cell is the building block of the nervous system, and you can get there many ways. You can get there from a fetus, you can get there from adults, you can get them there from embryonic stem cells, you can get them through a process that I'll talk very briefly about where you can even take mature cells, skin or blood, that you think are committed, and then just reprogram them, reprogram them back to being as if they were in the embryo or in the fetus. What these guys are meant to do is put the system together and to maintain homeostasis. The way they put the system together, let's use the nervous system as an example, is give rise to nerve cells, neurons. But not just the nerve cells, 
but to the supporting cells. For example, these are guys called oligodendrocytes that make this insulation around nerve cells. And these guys are called astrocytes, and these detoxify the environment and provide a lot of enormous guidance. Now, I'm gonna give you a list of everything that we in the stem cell field have thought we should be doing. And where can we make a contribution to to medicine, to, to, to mankind. I'm listing them, interestingly, in, in the order in which I think we will be able to make true successes in that regard. And I'm doing it actually in the order, top to bottom. Now notice where we started 25 years ago is actually still right there at the bottom. We're getting there. We're gonna do it, but it wasn't the slam dunk that we thought it was gonna be. And the reason was because the system is complex. You take a stem cell and you do a transplant into an abnormal host, there's a dynamic that takes place. Both elements change, and they change in response to these arrows, which uh, is a huge amount of crosstalk, and we've just been spending the last quarter century just trying to understand what these arrows are because what we need to do is work in concert with the system, not against the system, if we're gonna be successful. And that's where we've been spending our time. But in the course of doing that, we actually got to hear, and this is starting to get to what the topic is of this evening, predicting what is gonna be going on with a patient. Another way of thinking about it is modeling a disease, modeling development. And what we've tended to call this is disease in a dish or development in a dish. Now, there's a lot of writing there, but basically what it means is taking a cell and assaulting it in ways that you think the disease creates its problems. Or something else that's kind of cool is taking a cell from somebody with that disease believing that cell also has that disease, except instead of a whole person, it's in a dish where you can study it and interrogate it and test things on it. And if you can do that, then you can figure out what's causing the problem. Are there pathways that I should know about? Are there drug targets? Can I even discover drugs against those targets? Do I have a better diagnostic? Do I have a better prognostic? So that is making some enormous progress uh, in this field. Now, it's kind of become really, it's taken, gained an enormous amount of steam, I would say, probably in the last 10 years. But it was always something that we thought about doing. What we thought was, well, there are miscarriages, or the, uh, and fetuses die for various reasons, and certainly adults die of various diseases, for the nervous system, for example, can we just pull out the brain after somebody's died or get tissue from a miscarriage that had a disease and make these stem cells and get the cells we want and study them? With the advent of the embryonic stem cell field, which meant now IVF clinics that do in vitro fertilization, very often there'll be these blastocysts that will not be implanted because you've done pre-genetic uh, diagnosis, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and you know not to implant them. They have diseases, and now maybe make embryonic stem cells from these that would never be implanted, and, and turn those into neural stem cells and then into nerve cells, and try to understand those diseases. Now it's interesting, all of this always depended on death, uh, and, and just serendipity of getting material when you wanted, and it would be catch as catch can. With the advent of this technology that I'll describe to you called iPS cells or human-induced pluripotent stem cells, we in fact learned that we could take any cell and with certain reprogramming genes, turn it into a cell that looked like this. They could then be that. And it could be from living patients and it could be from whole groups of patients, and it could even be tissues in living patients that are very inaccessible. You know, skin is accessible, brain is not very accessible. 
And again, the way one does that, and I won't go through the details of that, is that one can take any cell that has a nucleus. Skin was the first, but now it can be blood, hair follicles, anything. You just put in your, and there's many, many cocktails to do this, you just push them back in developmental time, and they give rise to cells that are putting the system together. So how does that help with predicting? Well, now you can actually model a disease. Now, one way of really getting a handle, the ultimate of modeling a disease and predicting what's going on is an area that you may have heard about. This is personalized medicine, meaning it's not only the cells that come from groups of people with your disease. It's actually cells from you with your flavor of cancer or your flavor of Parkinson's disease or your flavor of autism or whatever it is, and you figure out what is going wrong with you and what is the best drug for you and what is down the road for you. Now, that's just getting started. And we're having trouble, well, no, we're not actually having trouble, but we're trying to figure out the best way to do that. Now, as a pediatrician, I can tell you one of the ways that we're trying to do it is, I'm not just a pediatrician, I'm also a neonatologist, which means this is, these are the kids I take care of. Everybody has to get born. Everybody has an umbilical cord. And what we're doing is this chunk of umbilical cord that normally would get thrown away, um, we're actually taking out and pulling cells out of and getting genetic and molecular information on one hand. And on the other hand, turning them into cells that are stem cells that can give rise to heart cells and nerve cells and blood cells and cartilage. And then once we have this bank, what we can do is, I kind of call it like the Framingham study. Anybody familiar with the Framingham study of how they figured out about the problems of heart disease in Framingham, Massachusetts? Took the population in Framingham and just followed them for 50 years to see who developed heart disease. And that's how we learned about high blood pressure and cholesterol and smoking. Well, this is kind of the molecular Framingham study where now we have these on these kids and we just follow them you know, for the rest of their lives, certainly into childhood. And you constantly do clinical correlation and figure out what are the biomarkers, what are the predictors, things of that sort. But once you have this information, however you get it, whether it's this way or you pull it out from patients, what we want to do is use stem cells to model diseases. And our conceit is that if we do it the way I just described, that these are not just nerve cells, and these are nerve cells that we made from initially skin cells or blood cells. These are nerve cells that have Alzheimer's disease or that have autism or, or Parkinson's disease. And that's where we spend our time looking to see why is the cell normal? If not, why isn't it normal? And how can I make it normal? Now, doing this is fine to understand the disease, but now this is where you want to start doing something about it. It's not enough just to predict. If you can predict, then our job presumably is to act and act to either block something from happening or to get a, a head start on fixing it. Now, one way is to just find all these drug targets. If you know what's causing the disease and you know that it's this pathway and you know that that pathway has this drug target, at our institute, we have a huge drug discovery infrastructure where we can screen literally millions of molecules looking for one that would change one of those cells in a way that is good or that we at least think is good. So that would be one way of intervening. And I'm going to give you a number of other ways. Now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to take you in this step of preventing or intervening, and I'm going to give you little vignettes. And each time, we, I won't get the answer now. We'll get it later on. I'm going to pose what the issues are. And I can guarantee they're going to start getting from, oh, no brainer. Absolutely, I would do that to stuff at the end of the talk that I think is probably going to be not so easy to, to, to grapple with. So the first thing is, well, what about aging? Everybody wants to do something about, 
you know, you can't stop aging, but maybe you can block some of the problems, some of the diseases of aging. Now it's starting to get a little, well, maybe not harder, but a little bit more getting right into the disease range, Parkinson's disease. That's a movement disorder, a bad disease. Um, not, not lethal until you start getting to the very end stages, even controllable with drugs for many, many years. Now we're starting to, that's a, that's a neurologic disease. How about starting to get into psychiatric disorders? Well, that, that's starting to become a little interesting. And we've been spending some work on looking at bipolar disorder, particularly those that are trying to figure out why does lithium work in this really very disabling psychiatric disorder. And again, we take skin samples from patients with bipolar disease, just the way I told you, skin samples. We turn them into these iPS cells, then turn them into neurons. And we found out that if we started looking at these nerve cells, that what we think is wrong is this fundamental problem in these nerve cells that part that makes connections to other nerve cells. And that's this area right over here, where two cells have to communicate to each other. And this is just not right in patients that have uh, bipolar disease, but lithium actually normalizes that. So if this were a mouse model, and this is a manic mouse over here, lithium, and then also the process that we think we can understand and have better drugs for, will now take this animal, circling like that, and make it more like that. So good idea? Well, you know, it's not as clear cut. For some groups, that is a good idea. I've spoken with patients with bipolar disease, for example, that often say, I don't want you messing with my creative process or how I deal with my own moods and things like that. So now we're starting to get a little controversial. But I think patients would have a choice if we had a drug to offer them. All right, what about treating problems really, really early? And I don't mean day of birth. I mean in utero as a fetus. So a long time ago, we did a, a study where we went into fetal monkeys. This is an ultrasound of a monkey. And here's the little head, there's a little paw, there's the butt, there's the tail. And we could take stem cells right into this area over here. This is while the brain is being formed, the cortex is being formed, and let our cells start mixing with the monkey's own cells. And what we found, and this is just schematizing it, is that our cells, as the red stars, just completely joined the parade, just integrated right into the brain with the monkey's own cells. And this simply shows that that's our cell over there, this black one, right next to the monkey's own nerve cells over here and over here. Now, this was a normal monkey. But what about if this was a monkey that, for example, had a disease? And these cells have a, that nerve cell has a disease, that nerve cell has a disease, ours are fine. We're just going to dilute it out by putting in our nerve cells. We're not getting rid of these guys. We're just kind of putting in good cells to join the parade over there. And it's not only mature cells. What we're able to do, in fact, was make, remember I said that the adult nerve cells, neural stem cells that participate all throughout life live around the ventricles. Well, we're able to do those too. They populate, so these guys, our guys, would be participating all throughout life. So now, is, is that something that you'd be willing to do? Well, you might say, OK, I, I am willing to do that, but it depends on the disease you're talking about. All right, so these cells can also secrete various enzymes and gene products and things like that. And we know that there are these terrible inborn errors of metabolism in kids. They get born missing an enzyme. These cells make the enzyme. And Tay-Sachs is just one example, but there's many. There's, you know, there's probably 70 of those kind of diseases. But if you went in, and it, the amount of symptoms completely depend on how much enzyme you put in, and you only need a tiny little bit of an enzyme, 2% of normal. But the earlier you go in, the less the problem would be. You get in early, and you may actually have a kid who's acting normal. Would you do that? Well, you know. 
it might bother people that you're going in utero during brain development with somebody else's human cells. I'm gonna make it even harder. So this is Huntington's disease. These are the symptoms of Huntington's disease. Here's brain degeneration. The most famous Huntington's patient, of course, was Woody Guthrie. Now, we can diagnose whether a patient will get Huntington's disease. You, we know it prenatally. There is no treatment. Um, and it doesn't hit until, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. But could you imagine if we did what I showed you before, taking our normal cells and got these cells integrated into the developing brain, now maybe it, we're not gonna cure the Huntington disease, but maybe we'd dilute out the mutant cells so much that what is a lethal incapacitating disease is now just maybe a minor problem. And you're doing it in utero for something that's not gonna be a problem for four decades. Would you do that? Now I'm making it even harder. Now we're gonna go back not just to the fetus, let's go back to conception, okay? And would you start messing around pre-implantation with an embryo and you know that you can do it? You can probably fix that disease. And by fixing it here, that means really preventing it in this kid. So here's a really bad disease in kids. It's caused by abnormal mitochondria. And we know now there's a way, or at least it hasn't yet really been done. It's only been done in dishes. It's not really been done yet. But I, I, as you saw, I was chair of an FDA committee that had to advise on this. And I can tell you that while there's still a lot of bench work that needs to be done, this will happen. And mitochondria are carried in the mom. That's who, and families that want to have offspring, certainly that don't have the mitochondrial disease, but basically have their genetic component, might do this. You take the mom's egg, and the nucleus really, that, that encodes the genetic content of the mom. Her mitochondria are flawed, but now you have a good normal egg. You have the, the nucleus from the donor. You have really good mitochondria out here in the cytoplasm. And all you do is you take this mom who's carrying the disease, you take her nucleus, you stick it in here. You get rid of this one, of course. Get rid of this one, put that one in here. And now the dad, all in vitro, fertilizes it. So pejoratively, this used to be called three, sometimes it still is, three parent embryos, because there's three, three parents involved. But most likely, the kids that come out of this will not have a mitochondrial disease. Would you do that for this disease? And then the next question is, any other diseases? Well, this is perfectly meant for mitochondrial diseases. But once you move a nuclei around, you could move any trait, go from here to here. So when do you draw the line and who decides that and what would you do? So now we're getting into the really, really tough part, the real ethically difficult part. So obviously this is fertilization and then you get the cells dividing, dividing, dividing. Here's maybe around day six, six or eight. It's called the blastocyst. This is usually just a little bit before what gets implanted. This is where embryonic stem cells come from. And what we know is we can change things in here through a process called gene editing. You probably have heard about this, CRISPR-Cas, or gene or genome editing. We can change things over here. Right here in San Diego, an investigator, not, not me, but an investigator in our building, uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte, in, in collaboration with an investigator up in, in, in Oregon, has done this now with human embryos. They weren't implanted, but this can be done in human embryos for a lethal gene in this particular case. So in other words, they were able to make a change here. And you could say that, you know, that, that's really quite remarkable. 
the question that I'm going to be posing to you that we're going to be discussing along with everything else is, what genes are you willing to change? Not only that, that process was done here. But as you go earlier and earlier and earlier, it is not only going to change the genes of that particular kid, it's going to change the entire lineage, your entire inheritance. So that family who this, you know, this kid's progeny will also have that gene changed as far as, the, as that lineage goes. Meaning that's the term that means going germline. The further you go back, the more likely it is that you will go germline. So you're changing not only that patient, but that patient's descendants in ways that we may or may not understand. Certainly, we, we hope to get rid of bad genes. That's the goal. So with that, I'm going to end and just say that this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night and at the meetings I have to attend to makes for absolute Talmudic debate. So uh, hopefully we'll have, a, we'll have a good debate ourselves here. Thanks. So um, I realized after hearing Evan speak that I was far too um, meek in my, in my imagination about what could be done with tonight's program. I hope you recognize, as I did, that what Evan has just done is he's covered basically the purpose of all of biomedical science <laughs> and what we want to do and then raising the questions of what things should we do. Um, so given that broad, that broad uh, sort of uh, overview that he's given us, um, tonight there are a number of things we might want to look at. And the first one I want to do is, is ask some of the fundamental questions we often ask about technologies. First, the technology itself. Um, we know that, so, it, so basically how far are we from a gene editing perspective? So we know that some people have modified embryos in vitro. They haven't implanted them, as you said. How far are we from somebody being able to say, I can do this, I'm going to do it. In this country, it's not legal, but um, what, how far are we from that happening? Pretty close, pretty close. I mean, using uh, genome editing is now a routine procedure in every stem cell lab to change cells in a dish. And in fact, you can't even get a grant funded or a paper published if you've not used this as controls. Fixing a gene, you know, if you think a gene is doing something that's important, you have to then prove it via the scientific method by fixing the gene, showing it goes away, creating a genetic defect in naive cells and showing you recreate it. So genome editing is actually happening routinely now in every stem cell lab. Not too many labs venture into actually changing human embryos, though changing mouse embryos to make various transgenic mice is happening also all the time. And I think, um, I think the technology is there. There's still some concerns about off-target effects. In other words, that means shooting to fix one gene, but also affecting another gene, um, which, which is a concern. And not just unintended uh, effects of ch changing one gene uh, unintentionally, but also the, the idea that if you alter one gene, that's part of a whole network, and maybe you don't know other genes that it might be changing downstream. Um, however, having said that, these are just mere technical hurdles, and they will be fixed, and they are being fixed. So we can't kind of just kick the can down the, down the road saying, well, it's not practical yet. You know, maybe it's not practical now, but in two years it will be practical. So um, separate from the practical question is the political, legal, social question. And I know that you aren't a politician, at least not yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what's your sense of what hurdles have to be overcome before we could even start doing this in humans from a regulatory perspective? I mean, where would that? Well, you know, I think first is, you know, the first hurdle is the hurdle that anything in medicine has to, uh, has to confront. 
just whether it's a drug or a procedure or a device, and that is, A, is it safe? So we, we still will need clinical trials to show it's safe, and in a case like this, safety may not become apparent for years down the line, maybe even generations down, but safety. And then efficacy, meaning does it work? Uh, even if it's safe, does it work? And then if it works, is it better than just standard of care? Um, I, I, I can say that one of the debates that actually, t I was telling you about this uh, trying to prevent the passage of mitochondrial diseases. Now that was, that, that was pr uh, uh, the technology involved in doing that is a real tour de force. One could step back and say, all this happens because there's a mom and a dad who are absolutely committed that their offspring have their genetic component. One could also say a much easier way to deal with this is adoption <laughs> or egg donation. So this is a, you know, it's a, a long run for a short slide. So one, everything has to be better than standard of care as well. So those are the first hurdles. Then the next hurdles are, and you know, you and, you and I have talked about this, um, and I, I have to say I, I learned a lot of my ethics from, from Mike and uh, Larry Hinman, who was another colleague of ours, that everybody talks about slippery slope arguments. If you're going to do the lethal gene that Juan Carlos did, which is this lethal gene that causes sudden death from heart disease in kids and young adults, that's, a, that's okay, but where do you stop? And then, of course, the slippery slope argument say, well, maybe we'll, will, you, will you stop at genes that are simply determining hair color or sex or gender or something of that sort. I also learned from Mike that slippery slope arguments are weak ethical argumentation because you can always put you can put handrails in the slippery handrails in the slippery slope. One probably what one w what we will need to do is put together some commission, and this will probably be more than just the IRBs of a particular hospital. Very, many of you may be familiar when DNA was very very controversial in the 70s. There was put together a commission called. Uh, 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 the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, the RAC, that at the time assessed every use of manipulating DNA. Interestingly, after doing that for about 30 years, they were just disbanded about three or four years ago because it just didn't seem to be necessary anymore. And I think a similar commission would probably be necessary before anybody proposed changing a gene by this kind of technique and would have to be assessed by kind of a multidisciplinary panel of experts and lay people and clergy people and things of that sort and philosophers. But we're there, I mean, we need to confront this now. This is, this is, not, being, this is not science fiction anymore. Yeah, so that was an excellent answer to the easy version of my question. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't notice. <laughs> so, um, let, let me be more specific. So in, in California, um, in terms of research and research funding, you aren't allowed using California funding to um, um, modify an embryo, a human embryo, and take it past a stage, certainly to implant it. And the federal government doesn't allow you to do anything. Now that is research. So um, what I'm really getting at is, so somebody with private money could do pretty much anything now? Is that? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that we like to think that, uh, that our, our community of scientists and our community of scholars really do not have nefarious intent. However, you could have people who have private funding do things that, uh, you know, that would not be very savory. But quite frankly, this has been going on since the advent of any kind of, of intervention, selling laetrile for cancer. 
you know, certainly was done back in the 60s and the 70s. And with the stem cell field, we're all familiar with these offshore clinics that make all these kind of claims. Uh, none of them are supervised, none of them are sanctioned, and all of them really uh, have, have incurred the wrath and, and, hope, and even some litigation from, uh, from the government. But here too, somebody could do something if they wanted to. So I'm, I'm going to start on some of the questions that were handed to me. So uh, the first I should, one. I should add that this is, it takes an enormous amount of skill. This is not something that just anybody can do. So the Laetrile story is anybody could get Laetrile. For somebody to be able to actually do this takes such incredible training. And the training would only happen actually in one of the top tier medical facilities. So that, that's a bit of a screening process. Okay. There is at least that barrier. Um, so this question you've addressed to some degree, but maybe um, to look at it a little more deeply. The question is how reliable is gene editing? So from the studies that are done in non-human animals mostly, um, what, to what extent are we pretty sure that when we make a choice to edit a gene, what's the percentage success, what, what could go wrong based on what we know? Well, you know, it, it, it literally is getting better by the month. Um, so there were, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So nowadays, the, the technology for genome editing is becoming more and more and more precise. So it's pretty reliable when you're just doing cells in a dish, probably even mice. Uh, the Chinese attempted to manipulate embryos probably about three or four probably three or four years ago, and even they said they were getting so many off-target effects that even if they had wanted to implant the embryo, it would be such a flawed embryo that it, it, it probably wouldn't even survive. Juan Carlos just did that experiment that I showed you the paper of. That was done about four, this summer. It was published this summer, and he really didn't get any off-target effects. Um, now, the interesting thing, he fixed things by a mechanism that he hadn't expected. What he did, and this kind of, and the only reason I'm saying this is that even when you think you know the answer, you don't really know the answer. So that still is the limiting factor, at least for scientists. The gene that fixed um, that particular embryo, even though he put in a good copy, was not his copy. The very act of putting in this foreign gene made the embryo borrow some of the dad's genes and fill in in a way that it hadn't. So it was actually fixed by the embryo itself, but only in response to that. So I guess there's, even if it's not precise, I mean, even if it's become more precise, we still don't entirely know all the mechanisms. So that's somewhat humbling. Yeah, so that's, that's relevant to the next question, which is they said, how is the FDA addressing off-target effects and thinking about technologies like this? What would they be looking for? How would they? I, I, the genome editing, to my knowledge, hasn't really reached it to the FDA level because it still is just so experimental. They're not, nobody's ever approached them with even the notion of wanting to do a clinical trial. We, we had to vet the mitochondrial issue because that individual did approach us. Matoplov in, in, in Oregon did approach the FDA and said, pose the question, what do I need to be able to show you guys to be able to do a clinical trial doing this? So he wasn't ready to do it, but he did, you know, he, he was looking at doing it and wanted to know what preclinical information would you need to be able to give us the go-ahead to do a clinical trial, and then what would that clinical trial look like? So we, we were forced to confront this, and the answers that we came up with, you know, it, it was a pretty long document, and then the UK was confronting this, and we also testified for the UK that was going through this as well, was, well, we really need to show that the mitochondria are working, that the cells work well. We also said we need to see a few generations of animals. And not just do the animals look OK, are their muscles OK, are their hearts OK, are their brains OK, how do they perform under stress? And do they pass these modifications down to offspring? 
So, you know, very, not ethical questions, very solid scientific questions before we could do that, but you're the one who taught me that uh, good data makes for good ethics, so. Yeah. Well, they interact. Um, so, uh, a lot of the presumption for our conversation tonight so far is that you identify a disease you're interested in, you identify the gene that is the cause of or allows that disease, you fix that one gene, but in fact, most diseases are probably multi-genetic. So um, any way to give us a handle on how much, and that's what this question is about, so how many diseases or what percent actually might be amenable to this approach? Um, do we, are we talking about a handful of diseases at this point, or hundreds, thousands? So at this particular stage, and in fact, I would say even for this whole disease modeling in general, these are only diseases where there's a single gene that's been identified. As you saw in the video, maybe it could be one other gene, but that adds complexity. That is not the minority of diseases. In Parkinson's, for example, only 15% are familial that are tied to a gene. Most are what we call sporadic or idiosyncratic. We don't know what's going on. Same thing with ALS, same thing with Alzheimer's, same thing with most diseases. Now, I, I should say, and I didn't get it, I, I told you the story of some work that we were doing in bipolar disease. I, I glossed over it, but looking to see whether stem cells can give insight into these diseases that we call polygenic, multifactorial complex, is one area I've chosen to actually uh, take on as one of my targets, as, as one of my challenges over the next few years. Bipolar disease does not have a single gene. And in fact, what we found in doing that whole study I described was that it's not a genetic defect at all. It's a regulation problem in the protein that's made by a number of genes. And what goes wrong is just how that protein is regulated. Now maybe at some level, that regulation is encoded by genes, but at the level we know now, it's not a gene problem. However, we do think that if we now focus on this, and the way we did this is used by other people looking at these complex diseases, we will start coming up with targets. Now that, a target that's amenable to gen genome manipulation for those diseases, even if we understand some of the mechanisms, that is, that I, I think I can confidently say is decades off. But the monogenic diseases, those will be the first targets and those are not that far off. Yeah, so actually, by the way, if anybody does have questions, you want to come to the microphone, let us know. Just and you can line up over there. And um, actually, if you're ready, I'll, I'll let you go next. So. Great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, so in regards to this question of uh, what the U.S. wants to do in terms of uh, germline editing, I know uh, earlier this year, I think February, the National Academy of Sciences issued a statement, and, and they said that they were basically warming up to the idea of uh, allowing germline editing to move forward in the context of uh, uh, removing a, a, a gene that would cause suffering and, and disease and whatnot. I'm curious uh, whether you think their decision to issue that statement was related to the progress that's happening in China in that there's been these publications coming out from Chinese scientists showing they're moving forward with that, you know, at, within their country. Do you think that puts some kind of competitive pressure on the U.S. to green light that for the scientists here? I'm not sure if it was competitive pressure, but I think it is the pressure of knowing that the job of the scientist is to push, push boundaries. And I, I think independently of whether the Chinese were pursuing this or not, I think American scientists because they're inquisitive and ingenious and hardworking and careful, would be would be doing this on their own. And I think that you know the the society, the academy knew that um, you know they they better start getting involved and at least police the area. 
I think there may have been some concern, however, that to, to get back to the Chinese, that if in any way they did ham, uh, kind of impede the research by scientists uh, of good faith, as we like to think of ourselves here in the States, that the field would be totally co-opted by those that are not as careful and there could be real problems created. So in that sense, I don't think it was a necessarily a competitive thing that, that forced them to do that, but the recognition that this is a space that somebody will occupy. This is a way to ensure that it's occupied by those who are careful and thoughtful. And that question is actually one that raises some really, I would say, disturbing questions. That in the end, so, there are things that um, in this country we've decided so far we're saying you can't do, and there are other countries with fewer regulations that might do them. One of the reasons we've said we don't want to do them is because of the risks that go with them. And for example, I can imagine a lot of question about what will be the risks if we start pursuing genetically modifying human embryos, implanting them, and we need, we're going to need to balance the benefits of saying, I'm going to choose this embryo, edit it, and then implant it, as opposed to choosing a different embryo or adopting a child from another country. So in this country, we're saying, we don't want those women to take that risk. But if other countries ignore our rules and then move ahead, then should we take advantage of that knowledge? And I think the answer is we're going to, <laughs> but just should we? <laughs> Well, that, that gets down to the, you know, the, the whole Mengele discussion. Yeah, exactly. You know, can, do you benefit, even if data was obtained in an unsavory and unethical manner, can we learn, can we use those data, or at least learn from those data? Boy, that, that's, that's a tougher question that I think I myself can, can answer, but I, uh, you know, I would say that if you learn something and um, you had no role in, in doing it, it's presenting there, and having that knowledge would prevent you from causing harm or making or duplicating a mistake, I think it would probably be bad medicine to ignore something that you know is going to be a problem just because you didn't do it. Yeah. For, for the record, that is one strategy that has been used for material that came out of Nazi Germany in medical experiments. Many people said these, were, this data were, these data were obtained under highly unethical circumstances. So the way to deal with it is, if we feel the data are of value, is to make sure we, at the same time, make it very clear that what was done was unacceptable. And so we don't turn away, we don't ignore what's happened. We, at the same time, as used, using the data, try and make clear that it's problematic. Not an entirely satisfactory answer, though. So. Yeah. But, you know, even, you don't even have to go so far back to Nazi Germany to talk about medical procedures that now we think of as horrific that were standard medical procedures back in the turn of the century that gave us knowledge, not, not only to stop doing it, but told us things. So doing lobotomies taught us a lot about what the human brain does. Um, various accidents of nature, accidents of war. And uh, so um, there are things that, that we do not do now, and, uh, but because we did learn from, from bad practice. Yeah, so. So we've already agreed as a society that parents have to belt their children into the car, they can't give them alcohol at an early age. Um, there's court-ordered chemotherapy for uh, kids with cancers. Um, so if we know how to prevent offspring from being harmed, why wouldn't we make parents at a risk of Tay-Sachs or sickle cell or uh, cystic fibrosis make, their, make sure their offspring will not have those diseases and cause that suffering? You know, um this, this is, you know, it's a major debate. You know, as a pediatrician, my job is to be the advocate for the kid. And, you know, and 
from my from from my point of view, the kid is once the age of viability has been obtained, a, attained. But you know, this is an ongoing debate. You don't even have to go to something as uh, you know as clear cut as not exposing kids to drugs, fetuses to drugs and alcohol and things like that. But we're discussing whether can parents decline immunization of their kids. Um, and I, you know, I fall down on the side, and I'd be interested in hearing your feedback. And there's a, there'll be a lot of pushback. I, I fall on the side of saying you, you must immunize your kid. If you know that this is effective and it's safe and don't you know, put aside all the garbagey data that says it's not safe and it not only affects your kid but all the other kids in the schoolroom because of herd immunity, I would say you must do that. But I would get a lot of pushback from many, many people, maybe even people in this room if I were to say that. But we're debating that. I mean, this is, this is an ongoing debate. You could imagine, if, if we're debating immunization, you could imagine the pushback you would get to say, and you must also edit that gene out of not only your embryo, but your entire family's lineage going forward. Yeah, this is why we need to have these conversations. Um, and you know, I'm just thinking that it may seem, there, as you pointed out, there are some things that will be pretty obvious that most people will be on board with. But if you're talking about editing a gene or genes that are causes of bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. or if there was a gene or genes that would likely cause deafness, both of those are things that many people would say, oh, well, it would be great if you didn't have that. But there are many other people, even who have those conditions, who would say, this is something I value. And the idea that society is going to say, we've decided that that's not acceptable, it's going to be a hard sell. You know, e even these disease-causing genes, nobody would say the Huntington gene defect is a good thing to have. What, we're, what we don't entirely know, but nevertheless, this probably shouldn't stop us, is genes are there for a reason. They have whole networks, as I mentioned before, and even changing what seems to be a fairly clear-cut bad gene to have probably will have ramifications, and you just hope that the ramifications are not significant in, in changing things. I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on what you just said, the networks like of genes, yeah. like in the case of Hunt Huntington's or any other case, what, what are well, you talking you, about? Well, you know, for example, there, there are normal, normal versions of Huntington's. The, the, many of these genes play normal functions uh, in the body. Nature put them there for a reason. Um, you know, let me actually give you an example that's, that's plaguing the field right now of Parkinson's disease. Uh, most people know somebody with Parkinson's disease, either in your family or you or somebody famous. Most people know Michael J. Fox is, is the most recent example of somebody with Parkinson's disease or Muhammad Ali. Um, Despite everything, despite everything that we do know about it, we still don't know exactly what causes Parkinson's disease. We don't even know the hallmarks that describe that disease, whether they are the cause of the disease or the result of the disease. Now, one of the examples of one of these is there's something in the brains of, par of patients with Parkinson's disease called Lewy bodies. And that was discovered back in 1912, so it's not a new discovery. What was discovered recently, and by recently I mean about 20 years ago, is that these Lewy bodies are made of something called alpha-synuclein, a protein. Everybody assumed, well, the Lewy bodies are bad, they're made of alpha-synuclein, that's bad, too much alpha-synuclein could be a problem. Well, it turns out that alpha-synuclein is also a normal component of the brain. You need that to make connections. You need that for these synaptic vesicles to pass. And even though you think this should be a great thing to get rid of this excess alpha-synuclein, 
getting rid of that may also change the whole networks of the genes that make dopamine. And those may change the genes that make this connection into the cortex and that change your mood. Dopamine is also necessary for mood disorder and, and things like that. So even when we think we're targeting something bad, it, there may be unforeseen consequences. Now, the, my feeling is we can't let, you know, we, we can't let that paralyze us, however. That medicine has to move ahead. We do the best you can with the knowledge in hand that you have and the tools, and you try to be careful and thoughtful. Um, but you, you can't just stay in one place. People are suffering. If you think that there's a way to help those people, I think certainly I took an oath to do that as best I could. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Um, I was curious, so in some of the ways that you edit the animals' genomes, then those animals have to be bred and bred to get a stable population expressing that change, and it's kind of ethical issue to breed children. So how would the FDA say that a certain genome, like, a certain manipulation actually, you, that person would have to live for a really long time, I'm trying to say, to know that that was okay for their genome. Does my question make sense? I think so. I, I do think that we talked about all the things that you can do genome editing on. I, I think it's safe to say even when the FDA will be confronted with this question, they will, I think they will limit the genetic manipulation to something that only happens in that particular embryo, that particular individual. We even went to the point with the mitochondrial story I was telling you that when we envisioned what a clinical trial should look like, we said that when you do do the clinical trial, one, it should be only for the most severe mitochondrial diseases. And there, there are ways to know what mitochondrial disease a mom is carrying. And there are some that are milder, and there are some that are really severe. We would only limit it to the most severe, and we would only limit it to the moms that absolutely will pass on the most severe form, and you can do that. And then we further said, just to be careful, we said, and probably we'd only advocate doing it in boys to begin with, because then we know if we're wrong about it not going germline. We don't think it will go germline, but just in case we're wrong, it won't get passed. So even there, um, we had enough control so that if, the, if we got it wrong, it would only be that individual for a period of time and not go across generations. I think the same thing would happen with genome editing. It would only be for very severe genes, probably only uh, in situations where it could not possibly go germline. So on that note, uh, we should, we're at, at this time went incredibly fast, um, and I want to thank Evan for a program in which we dealt with ethical issues, I think, better than we have in almost any of our previous programs. So. <laughs>